Yesterday, Char and I and uh, Barker went to the, the district all day conference. And, um, I almost don't want to preach this morning. I just want to share with you. But I'm not going to. <laughs> not right now. It was a good day. Sorry, most of the, a lot of you were there. It was worthwhile. It was a great day. It was a great day. We were well entertained and we learned. And we learned a lot. One of the things I learned, it's interesting, it goes along with the sermon, is that you know how often uh, we, as United Methodists, uh, tell somebody about Jesus? You know how often? Got any idea? You know. Sunday school knows. I already told them. Does anybody else know? Do you think maybe once a year? How many think maybe once a year you tell somebody tells somebody? Maybe once a year? No. <laughs> Two years? Two times a year? No. How about five years? Once every five years? How about once every ten years? You would think once in ten years you tell somebody about Jesus, who is your Lord and Savior. No. How about once every 20 years? Sad to say, no. We average once every 33 years. Which means for most of us, we're done. Some of you may be, have one left. That blew my mind. But, sadly to say, I sat down and thought about it. How often do I put myself in a place where I am able to share about who Jesus is in my life. Other than preaching to the choir, somebody that doesn't know Jesus, probably. I think about it. Doesn't happen very often. So if I'm not doing it, guess what? Most of you are not doing it either. So this little sermon, I think, kind of goes along with this. We're going to read a short scripture from Matthew chapter 5, verses, <coughs> verses 13 to 16. <coughs> Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it make me salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Jesus goes on to say, You are the light of the world. The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's all kinds of theories about how to motivate people. Well, after yesterday, I motivated. <laughs> Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Don Sutton had won a game in eight weeks. Critical press was suggesting that he be dropped from the starting lineup. 
said the future looked bleak and sudden felt terrible. Then before a game, Dodger manager Walter Halston <coughs> tapped him on the shoulder. I'd like to speak to you, Don, he said, and sudden prepared for the worst. Don said, Halston, I know how the past couple of months have been for you. Everyone's wondering if we can make it to the playoffs. You know, there's a lot of pressure. I've had to make a decision, and Sutton had visions of being taken off the mound. And also continued, if the Dodgers are going to win this year, he said, looking Sutton in the eye, they're going to win with Don Sutton pitching. Come with me, you're staying on the starting job. That's all I want to say. Sutton's losing streak lasted two more weeks, but because his manager, manager's encouragement, he felt different about it. Something in him was turning around. He found himself pitching the best ball ever in his career. In the National League pennant drive, he won 13 of 14. There are all kinds of theories on how to motivate people. We can do it without, with guilt. And pastors are good at that. We like to lay guilt Through fear. Done that a few times. Through shame. I try not to do that. But it happens. But these were not Jesus' methods. Jesus motivated through a positive message of hope and encouragement. Consider the lesson for today. Jesus says to his father, followers, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine that? Here was a motley crew of farmers and fishermen and tax collectors and housewives in a tiny and remote village in an obscure part of, of the world, and Jesus was saying to them, you are the light of the world. Talk about a statement of faith. Let's go farther than that. Talk about a crazy idea. Light of the world. That bunch must have sound, sound pretty absurd to them. Only Jesus could have seen through them, this motley crew, God would use them to indeed change the world forever. Now do you want to hear something really absurd? We are the light of the world. Jesus says to us this morning that we are the light of the world. So what does it mean? Well, let me suggest some possibilities. It means, first of all, that we have a responsibility to the world. We are the light of the world. A lighthouse steers ships away from the rocks. A light bulb lights up a room. Light does not exist for its own glory, but to brighten up the world. That is the first thing Jesus is saying to us. We have a responsibility to the world. That is the first thing. I was reading recently about one of the most remarkable young men who ever lived. He was a young man who had been left blind in both eyes in the early childhood accident. In 19th century France, when this man lived, 
Blind children had little help and few hopes. But then a kind priest, Father Yates Folly, took an interest in him, and he was amazed at the boy's intelligence and eagerness to learn. So with his parents' permission, Father Polly enrolled the boy in the Royal Institute of the Blind in Paris. Thrust into a new and frightening environment, the boy was lonely and depressed. In time, he, however, he found friendship and encouragement. Unfortunately, he was frustrated by the Institute's lack of books in raised print. He also found the symbols in raised print confusing. So he set out at the age of 12 to invent his own system. And after three years, he perfected the method, but he encountered indifference, hostility when he tried to convince the world that his system was better. Even with the support of the Institute's director, he was told again and again he was too young to have created a workable alphabet for the blind. Years passed, and as the man grew older, was, he was made a teacher at the Institute, and he became a fine organist always hoping that his method would find acceptance. But his health was frail. It was not until he lay in bed dying of tuberculosis that he heard the first steps were being taken to popularize his system. Though he did not live to witness it, Louis Braille's alphabet became the universal method of reading for the blind. His courage and hunger for knowledge enabled him to triumph over his disability and open new worlds to future generations. Lewis Braille became a light for those whose physical eyes had failed him. How wonderful it is when a young person sets out to make the world a better place. Some of you can remember when the pulpits of this nation sounded with the call for young men and women to go out as missionaries to be a light to a world in darkness. We don't sign to sound that trumpet as we once did. First of all, we don't have the young people even to sound the call. We don't call people to really sacrifice all they have and all they are for the good of humanity. We are the light of the world. We have responsibility to the world. We also have something that the world desperately needs. We have something the world cannot find anyplace else. Mother Teresa was speaking to persons who had come to meet, to meet her from all over the world. And among the groups which she spoke with one of the religious sisters from many of the North American orders, after her talk she asked if there were any questions. Yes, I have one, the woman sitting near the front said. As you know, most of the elders, the orders uh, represented here have been losing members. It seems that more and more women are leaving all the time, and yet, in your order, you are attracting thousands upon thousands. What do you do? Without hesitating, Mother Teresa answered, I give them Jesus. Yes, I know, said the woman, but take habits, for example. Do your women object to wearing a habit? In the rules of, of the order, how do you do it? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa said. Yes, I know, Mother, said the woman, but can you be more specific? I give them Jesus, Mother Teresa repeated again. 
Mother said to woman, we are all, all of us are aware of your fine work. I want to know about something else. Mother Teresa quietly said, I give them Jesus. There's nothing else. What do we have that the world can't find anywhere else? All we have is the person of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we are often reminded that we live in a pluralistic world. Today there are persons of many religious backgrounds who are calling our country their home. And we can learn many things from our new neighbors. If someone should ask you though, what is distinctive about Christianity? Think about it. If I were to ask you, what is distinctive about Christianity? What would you say? All we have is the person of Jesus Christ. Give them Jesus. As Mother Teresa replied. The greatest heresy current today is that all religions are the same. I don't know about that. I don't think all the churches that are called Christians are the same. I don't think they'd say they were the same. They have one thing in common. The person of Jesus Christ. You can find help in all of the churches, but in all of the religions. But what you can't find is the story of the prodigal son or the good Samaritan or the rich fool. There's no higher order of life than that which Jesus taught. <clears throat> Christianity as an institution has no peer. Literally, we have a responsibility for the world. We also have something the world cannot find anyplace else. This brings us to the last thing to be said. We this church is not the source of the light. But we are the reflectors of a much greater source. There is one who has touched our lives and given us the power and the authority to touch others. Eric Butterworth once told about a college professor who had a sociology class go into the Baltimore slums to get a case histories on 200 young boys. The students were asked to write an evaluation of each boy's future. In every case, the students wrote, he hasn't got a chance. 25 years later, another sociology professor came across the earlier study. He had his students follow up on the project to see what had happened to those boys. With the exception of 20 boys who had moved away or died, the students learned that 176 of the remaining 180 had achieved extraordinary success as lawyers, doctors, and businessmen. The, the professor was astonished and decided to pursue the matter further. Fortunately, all the men were in the area and he was able to ask each one, how do you account for your success? In each case, the reply came with feeling. 
there was a teacher. That teacher was still alive. So he sought her out and asked the elderly, but still alert woman what magic formula she had used to pull the boys out of the slums into a successful achievement. The teacher's eyes sparkled and her lips broke gently into a smile. It's really quite simple, she said. I love these boys. The wonder of those boys succeeded. The teacher loved them. Once there was a teacher who loved his students. He saw possibilities in them that no one else saw in them. He saw possibilities in them. And he said to them, you are the light of the world. And so they became. <coughs> The love they received from him and passed on to others. Today there is no place in the wor this world that the light they received from him doesn't shine. Because of fierce persecution, it, it is sometimes only a faint flicker. Sometimes because of the weakness of the followers, the fire is uncertain and tentative, but still it glows. And now it is in your position and mine. We are the light of the world. Years ago, three, year, three young men decided to hop on a moving freight train on the south end of town in the Pacific Northwest. It was supposed to be a lark on a spring evening and the train was barely moving and, and as the three friends rode down the rails, the locomotive poured on the coals and really picked up speed. And before these friends knew it, they were doing about 40 miles an hour. They had left the city. Darkness was setting out in the boondocks and soon these three friends were cold, lost, and scared. After half an hour or so, they decided that they needed to do something. So in perfect but Cassidy fashion, they lined up on the door of the boxcar and bailed out. It was a tough, it was rough and tumble down into some brushes, several blackberry vines but they were okay. The problem was they were terribly lost and it was pitch dark. Eventually one of them looked off in the distance and saw a faint glow. It looked like there was a small town there. So the three humiliated joy riders began walking through the woods with each increment they traveled, the light became brighter and more distinct. There was a town out there, and soon the light became intense enough to illuminate their path. They wound up at a roadside restaurant where they called for help. These friends got home safely because they saw a distant light, and they walked toward it. It was an overwhelming beacon to them that led them where they needed to go. I don't believe that I'm being overly dramatic when I say that there are people in this world who are lost in the darkness and they're looking for a light, any kind of light, a light to lead them in their spiritual, emotional, and mental quest to safety. How about your light? Is it shining? Could they find their way home because of you? 
you and I are the light of the world and we have a responsibility to the world. We have what the world desperately needs. We, but yet we are not the source of the light, but we're merely a reflection, reflectors of the true light of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.